Hey there everyone, it's 6.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 26, 2022 years from something. Today I'm going to be continuing with Let's Consider Luke. A uh, quick few things. One, I'm using a new version of Screencast-O-Matic software. If things get kind of funny, that's why. I'm, they've made a lot of upgrades and I'm just kind of getting used to them. They're They're pretty cool though. That's that. The other thing is, um, so as some of you probably noticed, I didn't put out any briefs this week. And uh, the reason for that is because I had a few subjects that I thought would be great topics for uh, an OP brief. Uh, however, the thing was, none of them did I reach a point where I was like, yeah, okay, well, Definitely want to make a video on this because I think I've got a good grasp of what I want to talk about, how I want to talk about it, what I want to present. None of them really reach that point. The reason is, as many of you know, I've, I've been saying I'm working on a manuscript right now. It's going to make searching for Obery terms and finding the ways that specifically the King James has translated, because the King James is really this, the English standard. If we have an English standard, it is the King James. And the King James is coded to Strong's, is the reason for these things. So this manuscript will actually allow for um, the variations of a word entry to be searched instead of you having to go to a word entry whatever it is, let's just say like Strong's 776 is Eretz, land, and they might, you know, land, country, or whatever, but Eretz can actually be presented in a number of different forms. It can be the simple Eretz, it can be Eretz, um, it might be, um, let's see, sometimes it'll be like the definite et Eretz, it might be la Eretz, like two uh, arets, you understand like but arets, uh, in by near the land. So these are different variations and a variation represents a change. And so up until this point in time, there hasn't really been a way to search for those variations and immediately compare them to what the standard English translation is. I've I've put out with the help of a a very gracious, talented, and helpful individual uh, who wishes to not be named. So I will respect that. I've put out a number of lists and, and manuscripts and things like that to help search out Obery, whether it's in the context of, of Strong's. I also have a, a Strong's Koine document that's keyed to a regular English, Western English keyboard. You can search through that too. And there are a lot of words, um, uh, roots in Koine Greek that are very interesting when you start searching those out too. So this is the reason that I create these tools. It is for anyone who wants to look deeper and find out how various words and terms and ideas have been manipulated. I'm trying to create better and better and better tools for doing that. So right now I am creating one that is essentially an interlinear manuscript that is in Obery and it's all keyed just like the Obery and the Strong's and the other manuscripts. Every single Obery word entry has its Strong's code right next to it in another color. All, all three of the different types of entries in this interlinear are color coded for ease of, of reading. You can distinguish easier the Obery from the Strong's number uh, from the King James translation. The King James translation will follow the number in blue. So you have the black and then you have the red and then you have the blue. The thing about doing that, when uh, this gentleman who, who does these for me does these things. Oftentimes if I ask, can, can you do uh, whatever? We'll say the, uh, the, the coin A, the Strong's coin A list. Uh, this was something recent. I said, can you put this in a certain format for me so that I can, you know, make this? Cause it's long. I think the Strong's coin A Greek is, uh, five, six thousand entries. It's a lot. 
uh, for the New Testament being as small as it is. There's a lot. And so what he did is he put that all into a, uh, a simple like Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Notepad file. And I was able to go in and just copy those and paste them in and put them in the, the, the font that I thought was best. And what I did was I used a font that um, worked with a Western English keyboard. And then uh, after doing that, you have to do all of that manually. So that does take time. Um, then I inserted cross references throughout the entire document so that navigation will be very easy because one thing that's a great thought killer if you have an idea and you really want to search it out and get to some answers fast is having to navigate a document that's not easy to navigate this was one of the hardest things about the um, um, the exhaustive Obery Biglyphs roots table which is also at the website on the references page is that I thought I was being very clever and I put every single root combination for any given glyph on a top cell of the table that all of this is presented in and the problem was by doing that it's actually a, a repetition cell so every page it repeats um, that's why you can if you go through that you'll see the different categories of the columns Every single page you go down, it's just a repeating cell. You can program that in uh, to the table. I did that with these cross references. And the problem was that when it's converted to PDF, um, whether this is something that LibreOffice needs to work on or they don't think they need to because it doesn't happen very often, um, the, the PDF conversion did not read those. It would read the first set that it saw and everything else would be bunk. It wouldn't work. So I had to go back to the drawing board and find out a new way to do that. That takes a long time. Also, when you're trying to find appropriate manuscripts to piece together, because say I said, all right, well, I want an interlinear manuscript that pretty much uh, exactly follows Mikriot Gedalot, which is the, uh, the Hebrew manuscript that King James was based on. Um, it's not that easy. Because what you have to do is you have to find a manuscript that is... Um, that follows um, MG, which is also considered uh, Westminster Leningrad Codex. You have to be able to find that in a way where, um, based on what I understand about the methods that he uses, where he can pull from that, uh, plug it in to uh, the program that he's, I believe, created to do these sorts of things then you have to be able to plug in all of those strong numbers and then you have to be able to plug in all of those King James uh, translated words in an inter interlinear format which nothing like that specifically in the way I want to do it which is Obri not Hebrew so Obri is oriented from left to right Hebrew the opposite it would be Obri and then uh, English in the sense of the Strong's coding and then English in the sense of the King James translation those don't always overlap because we weren't able to find a, a pure um, mg micro uh, uh manuscript that followed exactly like the uh the king james or an interlinear that would be <laughs> coded to the king james so we had to take one copy of, of one kind of manuscript which did have variations in hebrew and apply that to uh, another uh, in English, like King James English. And those didn't always add up. In fact, I, I believe he had to use the, um, uh, the Masoretico Critical. Um, and, and so what happens is when you, you have chapters between those two that don't overlap correctly, or verses that are in a, a, a second chapter, or some will have more verses that, that the other doesn't, these are the kinds of very serious uh, differences that there can be between these main manuscripts like Westminster Leningrad Codex would be sort of the older manuscript type and there are variations there and then you will have um, uh, Bibli uh, sorry, Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia which is um, more along the lines probably of um, Masoretico Critical but not exactly and so it's kind of tough to put those together 
So besides creating the cross-references for all of these, each book of the Bible with their chapters, okay, um, all those cross-references, which, which all books have to be done individually, but imported into a document, the cross-reference is done and then taken and put, put back into a separate document or else the document would get too large to manage. You have to break these things down, just like if you're doing a long video, like uh, bringing it all together. I had to break that into a number of parts. Um, so there's that, and then there's the corrections of the chapters. So this, And you have to do that manually, the corrections of the chapters, essentially looking at an existing manuscript that's interlinear and grabbing the words or just hand typing those words into these various areas that didn't translate over and therefore don't have the words in there. You got to put them in, sometimes take out. It takes a long time. And the thing is, I know for a fact, because I've been doing this so long and I've tried it already. So once I got the first five books of the Bible, I started trying it to see how well it worked and it works like a charm. So it's going to be a great resource, very demanding, and I really don't want to move on to much uh, of any other work without f finishing that and having it available. So every day it's about three hours of work on that, and then I try to get to other things. Pretty long explanation, but necessary, because it's for anyone who's interested in doing any kind of searches in the Bible for words or understanding the language better, this is going to be just the thing. It's going to be very good. Uh, however, yeah, it is demanding. So uh, until I'm done with that, at least, I don't have as much time to put together other materials, do other things. So uh, for anybody who does like the briefs, it's just something, uh, a different perspective. Uh, my perspective to listen to a couple of times during the week. Let me know in the comments that you'd like me to continue doing the briefs, even if I don't have these, these certain topical things done, because what I'm going to do, if that's the case, is I'll, I'll actually be making a number of briefs, probably in a series that are basically autobiographical. Um, and the reason for that is because I find when somebody gives their autobiography, it tells you so much about somebody that you you really can't understand if you don't understand a lot about them. Now, I'll completely understand if, you know, nobody finds that very interesting. Um, I can tell you that there's, there's a lot of things about my life or memories that I had, place that I grew up, people that I knew, uh, experiences, and a lot of the trouble I got in and experiences that I had to have because of that and forward that are, I think are pretty interesting because <laughs> I've never heard anything <laughs> quite like some of it. Trust me. So I can do that if that's something you'd like. <clears throat> the other thing is the, um, the channel and all the videos, Jonathan McTemis channel, not the Obery Project channel, because it doesn't qualify. The Jonathan McTemis channel is now fully uh, monetized really every single video except a few videos that are considered uh, like they have material that's the YouTube considers questionable based on their arbitrary standards or all of the the Obrey hours they will not monetize the Obrey hours because I am using that song Venus de Mello by um, sorry by television so I'm probably going to change uh, the intro and outro in those to something that's not, uh, well, something that's, um, what, license-free? It's not, yeah. And then re-release those. So there it all is in the first probably more than a few minutes of this. Sorry. Kind of necessary stuff. I am picking back up in Luke 21. And we're going to start at, uh, looks like, verse 10 and forward. Now, the other thing that hung me up is I've spent an inordinate amount of time on these verses from Luke because we're, we're in a section of the Bible that I believe has probably been interpreted a, a thousand different ways, and who knows how many of those ways are right or how many portions of those ways are right. Now, I did not 
go in. I did not go in and try to meticulously interpret this. This, this was not the point, and it was not the point of the series Let's Consider Luke. So I didn't necessarily do that, but I did take a number of notes that do illustrate some things that I think are just interesting to look at, especially in the light of the fact that I've been reading through this book, Josephus in the New Testament, by um, Mason. Why can't I remember his first name? Steve. Steve Mason. Um, even though I find this book to be mostly an apology for the existence and the person and the veracity of Josephus, which is, uh, I almost can't believe that somebody is attempting to do that because it he gets to these points where he literally has to say things like over and over again, he'll say things like, well, you know, we shouldn't, we should not look at Josephus um, just as, as, as a purely factual source. When you, when you have to start saying things like that, because he can't say anything else, or he would just be a bald faced liar. He has to point out all of these ways in which Josephus himself contradicts himself, mostly between uh, War of the Jews and uh, Antiquities of the Jews. He has to point these things out. They're glaringly obvious. But then he has to come up behind all of that and say, well, even though, you know, we can't uh, regard this as purely fact or purely truthful or <laughs> purely historical or or purely consistent, we should still uh, look at it as, you know, we can get a very good perspective from Josephus and definitely, definitely, definitely let's, uh, let's throw that in the cauldron with the Gospels and the other things uh, in the New Testament and stir them all around and see how confusing it can all be at the end of the day. But he does bring up a lot of quotes from, from Josephus which is important and is very valuable because I, for one, do not want to spend the uh, ridiculous amount of time reading through, and I, I have, I've read through large portions of Josephus from antiquities, from wars. Uh, I've never read against Appian or his biography, maybe snippets of those. These works are very long. They are very tedious. And and really, like anything else that's um, oh, let's say in in my humble opinion that is highly questionable at best. It's a difficult read. Things that are true, that have veracity and a value to them because of their truthfulness, I find far easier to read, even if they are about maybe more mundane or tedious matters. So because of all of these questions that are raised in this book, it has caused me to slow down a little bit and think a little bit more about Luke, not necessarily giving Luke more uh, props or more confidence, but looking at the whole thing and the four Gospels, just about everything about them. A little bit more in depth and maybe in ways that I hadn't before. So that's the other reason that there has been some time taken on these besides the fact that we're in one of the most, um, I would say, one of the most difficult to understand areas of Luke. It's in Luke and it's in Matthew. Uh, in Matthew, it's Matthew 24 and 25. It covers two chapters. In Luke, it merely covers about 20 30 something verses. That's it. If that. And in fact, um, part of the way through chapter 21, um, the subject changes just a little bit. So starting in Luke 21 and verse 10. Okay, so some real quick background where we left off. You show Jesus is in Jerusalem for the last time. He's in what they call the temple, but the Old Testament consistently calls beat. Yahweh. It's the house of Yahweh. Anyways, I went over 
probably what it was really like as compared to what they want to try to paint it as today because they need to try to fit it on that relatively small area they call the Temple Mount in Palestine, Jerusalem, or Al-Quds. Anyways, they would have been in the real area of the House of Yahweh, the Bet Yahweh. And according to Luke's version, they're pointing out all of these really fantastic things about it structurally. And that's when he tells them that it's all coming down, which is a huge shock to them because he hasn't mentioned this yet at all. And they get pretty upset because obviously his disciples and a lot of other people regard him as a very bona fide prophet. So in Matthew's version, the disciples, disciples come to him privately on what they say is the Mount of Olives, which is a bit dubious to find that in the Old Testament as, as far as the word that they say is olives and all of that. But keep in mind that in, in Palestine, the location they try to tell us was the biblical Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, the location they tell us the Mount of Olives itself, is is across a sort of ravine, and it, there's no river there. It sometimes there's water that comes through there in the rainy season. the The Mount of Olives itself is on an elevation higher than the structure that they tell us is the Temple Mount, and its peak. Of the, it's not a mountain. These aren't mountains, by the way. These are hills. There's probably no mountain in Palestine. There's hills. It's a, a rough area um, that's mostly rough because of what you can see, like geologically, you know, that dead ends into the Dead Sea and all of that. It's just a very rough area with a lot of hills and ragged, gravelly, um real just honestly it it's more oh most of the topography that you'll see on on either side of the dead sea whether we're talking about the tablelands on the uh east side or the the rugged area on the west side um all pretty much even at first glance looking to be very much just a product of the Dead Sea. Geological activity right there, whatever. So what they say is the Mount of Olives over there is higher, and it's so close to just the area that they say is the Temple Mount, and therefore the area that they say is the City of David, which is literally just an eight, eight acre, eight acre eight acre i have to repeat that peninsula of jutting hillish land anyways that adjoining hill which is undefended by any wall of any sort is so high and so close that any formidable enemy would simply just have to bring in catapult, not even anything longer range than catapult. If 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 we're believing they didn't use gunpowder and all that, just catapults, and they could absolutely pummel the city with incendiary projectiles. And there are, I believe, two other hills uh, nearby that same city where you could do the same. So this idea is just so remarkably ridiculous that that is actually the biblical Jerusalem. So anyways, uh, in Luke's tale, they don't go to the Mount of Olives, but he just starts saying these things, I guess in everybody's hearing, which is really weird because uh, I thought it was he had said in other places that it was for the disciples to know and understand a lot of these things about the kingdom and not just for everyone, but who knows. So starting in Luke 21.10, 
uh, the Lukian text goes on to say, now remember, the whole point, the foundation of this is them asking him, when are these things going to happen? They're extremely concerned about the destruction of the temple because of what it means, temple, the house of Yahweh, because of what it means if that's destroyed, their nation's destroyed, their identity is destroyed. And that's exactly how they're looking at it. That if he allows his house to be destroyed, he's going to allow his people to be destroyed, dispersed, scattered. Not a pleasant thought. So that is the, the main thrust of their, their questioning to him. When is that going to happen? They're, they're thinking about that. So keep that in mind. No matter what we read or how it's been interpreted, how it's been translated, what we've come to believe about it, that's their question. He's answering them based on that question and that concern. So in 21.10, Lucian text, um, Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren, and kinfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. So, okay. Basically, he's telling them some really horrible things are about to start happening. Really bad news. Now, if we go check the Law and Prophets, <clears throat> we would see that what he would be referring to here, I think, should have been something known or expected based on what Daniel said. Here's the thing. We have no reason. We have every reason today to believe that our enemies who are ruling the world have changed the calendar and they've changed the way that we perceive dating. But we don't have any reason necessarily to believe that that was done then. And they would know at that point in time <clears throat> what Daniel's prophecy said, basically, Daniel 9, there's that 70 weeks, right? And I'm going on just the assumption that that's correct and it's translated correctly for now. But no matter what, no matter if, if the translations we have of the 70 weeks are correct or not, them then should have known. For me, I, I, I guess I find it a little strange that they wouldn't know. Or wouldn't expect it. Or it would be a surprise. Because they had Daniel. I, okay, my assumption, they had Daniel. And the reason I'm assuming this is, for one thing, Jesus refers to Daniel. He refers to Daniel not only in Matthew's version of these events, but we'll see even in Luke and in a certain way the language that he uses. So for me, it would be, it's just kind of weird that it seems to be such a shock to them that this is going to happen. Um, perhaps 
perhaps the prophecy of Daniel was written in a way where, and you know, a lot of prophets are actually written in the way that the prophet tells the people from Yahweh, if you change, if you do this differently, I won't bring this judgment. I won't bring these pains. Perhaps they were looking at Daniel's prophecy that way too. Because in Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, it says 70 weeks have been de determined on your people. <clears throat> 70 weeks to do these things. And he lists out a number of things to do. You have this time in which to accomplish these things. So I guess it's reasonable to think that a lot of people at that time who were familiar with Daniel's prophecy would have thought it is an open-ended question in the sense that if we do fulfill these things, perhaps this will not come upon us. And maybe a lot of the surprise is the fact that he's confirming that it it's going to. Now, okay, there are some variations between what we would consider parallel passages between Luke and Matthew. Now, the Matthew parallels are Matthew 24, 7 through 13. And I'm going to read those. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. <clears throat> My notes. Verses 10 and 11. Note in both Luke and Matthew, you show Jesus cites before the telos. Telos is the Koine Greek word used and translated as end, but meaning as in distance, and many of you probably recognize the root of that word, talos, like telescope, like forward. But they're translating it end, when in fact what he could be saying is before the coming of something that is at a distance, as opposed to the end. And these are the subtle ways that malicious translators and interpreters could change what the word probably better was expressing. So instead of looking at it as um, uh, the end, where do we got it? We got it at, I'm trying to find it in, in, Luke as opposed to Matthew because there is at least one point where he says end where it doesn't necessarily have to be end but specifically this tell us which would be more appropriate I found friends at a distance and I found offended um which word is tell us let me find that real quick okay my apologies it was in 21 9 but it was referring to these events that he's going on about in 21, 10 and after. Okay, that tell us is in Luke 21, 9. All right, so anyways, continuing with these notes. So there would be nation rising against nation. Not the end. Remember, he said the end is not. If he says the tell us is not yet in Luke 21, 9, He's likely saying that something that is to come in the future at a distance would not be there yet because before this, he has just gone over a number of other things. He went over the take heed that you not be deceived. 
Many shall come in my name. We went over this last time when you hear of wars and commotions. Okay, but he's talking about something that is of a certain distance and it is not here yet. And he's going on and on. There would be a number of things he's essentially saying that they should look out for that will be telltale signs of the event, which is what? The destruction of the temple, which was a signal of the destruction of Judah, Jerusalem. What remnant of Israel might still have been there? As we can see also articulated in uh, the book of Hezekiah chapter 1, that this third kingdom, Yun, there would be four horns in this third kingdom. We can also reference that in Daniel 8, and that they would scatter Judah and Jerusalem to the four winds of heaven. Four, 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 four horns. We always want to look for those kind of things. Interesting, there's four gospels. Anyways, uh, just to continue, but he says, um, in Matthew, oh, no, my notes, sorry. In the wrong place. So, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Yet so many teach those things that are found in Revelation as purely symbolic. And here's where we get into some, some difficulty about what is symbolic and what is not symbolic, but is literal. He's literally saying, and I would, I would conclude by the context of this text, that he's talking about things that are specifically literal, not symbolic. However, we are going to get into portions of the text that look more symbolic for certain reasons than literal. And that's the funny thing, too, <coughs> excuse me, about Revelation. And Revelation is one book that a lot of people have had a field day with. And the reason being is because it starts out in the first few verses where it says in the English translation that this was a, a revelation of Jesus Christ that he signed and, and uh, signaled through his servant and so on and so forth. And we have that word, which is um, like the precursor to the word that we use today, uh, semaphore, it's semeo, okay? Um, a lot of people will just pick and choose what they want to be symbolic and what they want to be literal. Sometimes they're sincere and they'll, they'll pick what they think should be symbolic and what they think should be literal. And the problem is, I think we have a real issue with sorting out what portions of those should be seen as symbolic, what portions should be seen as literal, and this is something that needs to be addressed and fixed. Now, the reason I, I give, yes, yeah, Simeo, it's G4591, signify. It not only doesn't necessarily mean metaphor or symbol, but specify. Now that's important. Specifying. Why is it important? Well, uh, I wrote, when we think so much of or anything could be symbolism, which sometimes things are often signaled, such as in the text, these slippery Bible teachers, they get away with anything, and they do. And they are right now, under our noses, they're getting away with applying things that have been going on the last two years to all, all kinds of things in the Bible, which may or may not be so. But they're doing it, and a lot of you guys know exactly the kind of people I'm talking about. Um, like people who might teach that the jab is the mark of the beast. <laughs> Revelation 13. Um, where I would, I would definitely say, my opinion is, everything that we've seen here, in just these verses that I've read, are certainly literal, not symbolic. Now we go on to say that um, concerning verse 12 from Luke, Matthew 24, 9 doesn't mention the synagogues 
prisons, kings, or rulers, but both use para didomi, which is more a betrayal than a laying on of hands physically. This is why the translation in Matthew of the same word is deliver you up, telling the state on your neighbor and family. Not so much laying hands on you and dragging you into prisons, courts, and all that stuff. I mean, somebody might do that at some point, but I think what he is doing is he is giving the sense of what the state of mind and being would be among their own tribesmen. And we're seeing that. That we are seeing today. It's really sad, but most of us have no reason to even trust our own ethnic people because they've so many of them have been so brainwashed and are so in love with the world and trust the state and love their comfort and have no substance and believe in grace and they really, they, they're just floating on these endless waves of doctrine, as I believe James would say. These would be the kind of people who would betray you, which I think is far more accurate. What he's saying is the sort of betrayals um, that would go on. So who's the they? Um, the last subject mentioned was those coming in his name. So he does refer to them in pronoun form as they, um, perhaps, quote-unquote, Christians, false apostles, clergy. These are often the greatest enemies of God, Christ, truth, you name it. Now, verses 13 through 15, that is lifted from Matthew 10, not Matthew 24, which is supposed to be the parallel passage, of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 10, verses 19 and 22 and 30. Almost verbatim. So when he's commissioning his disciples to go out, Matthew's account follows a more logical progression, and there it, it could be part of the maliciousness of Luke, uh, the way that these insertions are made, which are not within context. Um, the fact that he inserts th that uh, kind of rhetoric here could be malicious in the sense of giving a false sense of security. Now, any of the prophecies from the Old Testament <clears throat> that I would consider being prophecies specifically referring to this end of Judah, because there was an end of Israel at a point in time, and then there was an end of Judah at a point in time. And when I say end, I specifically mean their time as a nation under Yahweh's protection in the land promised to their fathers and their descendants. That's the end I'm talking about. I'm not talking about their end of covenant because that never ends. It's the word always used is olam. Those covenants are olam. They are forever. He made covenants forever. Uh, people who teach this sort of replacement theology, um, they're, either, they're either ignorant or malicious. They really are. I went over replacement theology many, many years ago, and it just doesn't wash. There's far too much language throughout the so-called Old Testament that confirms that these covenants are ulam forever, with Israel and Judah forever. And even though Israel was cast off long before Judah, and Judah kept in store so that, uh, for instance, the covenants with David would be fulfilled. Um, in the land of Judah, there still needed to be a nation. Remember, when he split the two nations right after Solomon's time, he said he will keep a certain tribe intact for a certain reason. And this is why, even though Judah was got far worse than Israel. That's the end. The end of their nationhood, finally done, no more. And there would be terrible times for a very long time, for a very long time. And the, the, the types of t uh, events and things that would happen, as articulated in the Old Testament in various prophecies concerning this, they are not pretty. They're quite dark. So Luke 
lifting this from a completely different portion of Matthew and putting it in here as almost some way of just candy coating these things, in my opinion, seems to me to be malicious. Um, where, of course, Matthew's account reads things like, and they shall kill you, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake without that, um, without that sugar coating at the end. So I, I do think it's the, the tone and the material and the fact that he lifted those verses completely out of context. And whether Luke lifted them or f for some reason, you know, Matthew uh, lifted them from Luke from this portion and put them back here in the uh, commission of the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Either which way, it's really weird. It's it's very bizarre. If it's Matthew that we think is the bad actor, we have to ask those questions. And at some point in time, I have every um, intention of actually going over Matthew once we get past probably John, maybe Mark. And maybe a new look at, at, at all four and some issues with those. So, <clears throat> now I did... Put in as one additional note that Matthew 24, 14 includes, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Um, and my notes were, when is or was this end of the age? Back then or to come? Um... I think the purpose of that, oh, I don't know, <clears throat> is in part to sort of question the idea of, okay, again, I have asked this question a number of times, and I've gotten various answers from various people, most of them entirely unsatisfactory. Concerning why do we oftentimes find so much terminology in the New Testament, ideas in the New Testament, that we don't find whatsoever in the Old Testament? And a lot of people will say, well, you know, continuing revelation. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of that may be, but here's the thing. So if Yahweh says that he does nothing lest he reveal it first through his prophets... There's that. Now, if we consider uh, Jesus a prophet, that's fine, but everything he says really has to comport with what we see so far in the law and the prophets. Now, I'm not particularly saying right now that he doesn't. What I'm saying is we have a lot of terminology just in the Koine Greek that we don't have pure equivalence to in Obery. And that's something that bothers me. One of those terms is actually, um, see in Koine, it would be uh, Eowa or Eva Gelos. Eowa Gelos or Eva Gelos, depending on what accent you're putting on the Upsalom. And the way that they transliterate that is Evangelos. Okay? And that's the word that's often translated into gospel. And, of course, it's where we get this idea of evangelist and evangelical church. That's the underlying Koine Greek word. Um, I think it's really weird that, for one thing, that word is not pronounced in the way that it's spelled. There's that N that's put in before the G. <clears throat> that's interesting. I'm not sure that I've paid enough attention to see that as being like just a given, uh, that when you have that double G, that should happen. But it does happen in other words. Like, for instance, uh, agelos. The N is then inserted in the transliteration, becomes angel. Angel. I don't know why this is being done, unless perhaps uh, somebody, when they decided to do the English uh, or other language translations of this, they wanted to get these words 
uh, away from sounding like either ewa galos or a galos which those actually both of course sound like they have the same root and the interesting thing and they may they may actually just freely admit that they have the same root the interesting thing is it's we're just talking about uh, essentially a message though these words may actually have their root in obri being gala and anyone who i don't know may remember this is the gala is the word used for those israelites who have been dispersed carried away banished Gale. I find it interesting that these words in the New Testament, which they've applied a certain meaning to, um, bear so much resemblance to Obri words, which have a, a different meaning. But I won't get too caught up in that. I'll move on. So then the next little section of text is Luke 21.20 through 24 and then he moves forward this is all just going you know supposed to be in context moving forward with a, a consistent idea in mind to answer their question when will these things happen meaning the destruction of the temple so on and so forth so <clears throat> and when you see jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof is near then let them which are in judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled in the prophets daniel 9 and other places all things which have been written may be fulfilled but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, the people of Israel, specifically Judah. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles, ethnos, until the time of the ethnos, be fulfilled. Now that is all Luke 21, 20 through 24. Matthew, in a bit of contrast, in Matthew 24, 15 through 28, reads, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand very different that Matthew brings this up. And I'm not going to read the rest of the text in Matthew, but I'm going to get to the notes and um, refer to Matthew's text when I need to. That's really important. Matthew brings that up because what's interesting is we see this in Luke's account that he does refer to the things that were said in the prophets. Daniel 9 is probably the most precisely specific prophecy that we're aware of concerning these events, the determination on Judah. Matthew mentions it. I mean, Luke doesn't. He just says the things in the prophets being fulfilled. So the notes. So Luke verse 20 actually uses the same word in Koine. It's Eremosis G2050, being translated as desolation in some places, but apparently not in Luke. Um, no, he does use desolation, sorry. So it is desolation, and when we go to Matthew, we do see that desolation also in Matthew 24, 15. But here's the important part. He is speaking, as we see in Matthew, and this really should help to illustrate the big contrast and what I've been saying from the start, if you only had Luke to read, you did not have Matthew, so that you could go back and check, or even Mark, but say Matthew, you might not realize that he is speaking specifically of 
this abomination that makes desolate in 9, Daniel 9, which is also touched upon in Daniel 8 and Daniel 12. One event. This is one event. It would have been understood as one event. And the reason for this being, of course, because for one thing, as um, uh, Daniel and then, of course, you show Jesus um, articulates uh, specifically in Matthew that it would be the worst event that Judah or all the nation of Israel had seen in all of their history, and they wouldn't see one worse than that. You can't have that twice. And in order to try to sell us on the idea that their version of history was the factual one, being that there was this nation in Greece, and it was this great powerful nation, and it took control of um, Judah, or Judea, which they say is in Palestine. You see, all of this is all of this is so woven together. This is the reason why I can't just concentrate on language. I can't just concentrate on geography. You have to look at language and geography and history and ethnology. You have to look at so many things all together to get the full picture of what's going on, what has truly happened in contrast to what they're trying to tell us happened. This didn't happen twice. This is one event. One event that was worse than anything. And keep in mind that the, the records that we have, most specifically Josephus, that they try to tell us was this event, is no worse than other sieges that either Israel or Judah endured as recorded in the Old Testament. So that can't be the right event. This would have been far bigger, far worse. And as Jesus said, worse than anything before or after. But if you read just Luke and not Matthew, you may miss the fact that he's specifically talking about this event that Daniel mentions probably, what, three times in, in the course of his book, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 12. One event, the abomination that makes desolate, or the abundance and accumulation of lawlessness that has facilitated, necessitated, brought on great destruction or desolation. The abomination that makes desolate, which of course they try to change into this <clears throat> story about this Antiochus for Epiphanes and, and all of that nonsense, including the books of Maccabees, etc. So, um, it's yeah, it is unclear if it was deliberate or unintended by Luke um, to not uh, heavily back up, even though it's subtly the abomination of desolation. Um, it is interesting that Luke should write when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, um, backing up ideas from Josephus and other more mainstream sources, when in contrast, Matthew reads, When ye therefore shall see the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of by Daniel. You are going to, you're, so you're going to look back at Daniel. And you want to remember what Daniel had to say about these things. He's not saying when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies per se, but he's saying the details as articulated by the prophet Daniel. Um, and then it goes on in Matthew, standing in the holy place, uh, whoso reads, let him understand. Now this word holy is a bit odd. And without Hebrew or Greek root, um, Maybe, though it could be from ole, ascending, not separate, as we're often told. Uh, the Greek, however, is hegios, which is remarkably, and you might have heard this, like, if people talk about 
um, religious writings. They'll call it hagiography. That's the same basic root. So hagios, which remarkably like the Obri Hagi, which there was actually a prophet named Hagi, or they transliterate his name into Haggai, um, or the title of feasts. So the feast days are called Hag, i.e. appointment. Appointment. That's why the feasts are called Hag or Hagi. They are appointments. Now, if this were so, Yusho is telling them in Matthew and Mark, not Luke, established at the appointed place, topos, not necessarily locale, but being specific, a location in time or place. There's not a place, as in specific determined locale like a temple, mentioned by Daniel. This may be a Josephian swap by Luke. Specific appointment of Daniel's prophecy, which we could see in the language used in Matthew. Two, by Luke, being very Josephian, swapping it to uh, no Daniel, does not mention Daniel or the abomination, no Daniel and the temple or Jerusalem as a specific place. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, Daniel doesn't specifically say these same things. And neither does Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew. So just to point that out. Um, Luke leaves out winter and Sabbath. Um, winter, I think winter is a pretty obvious omission considering Palestine. The winters in Palestine are simply rainier. It is so rare that you will see snow in Palestine and specifically Jerusalem because Jerusalem is in the south of Palestine and it's quite hot there most of the time. It is a very arid environment, specifically in Jerusalem. We're not talking about the northern part of Palestine. We are talking about Jerusalem, are we not? So Luke doesn't mention winter. Um, why Sabbath? I don't know. I, I asked the question, was it because gates would be closed or a flight on the Sabbath would be conspicuous? Perhaps he, um, perhaps he says, pray it not be on the Sabbath because he did not know when this event would occur in the many places that it would occur. If an army or hordes of any type sweep over a land, uh, they'll come to you on a different day than they'll come to someone else. Um, Luke leaves out a lot of the specifics of violence, specifically like uh, not a time such as this since or from, which I just covered. Um, the mainstream Josephian accounts of the Roman siege of Jerusalem is not at all that different or worse. Um, the prophecies of Yun the third empire in the scheme of empires as outlined in Daniel 2 and 7 and detailed in Daniel's 8 and likely Daniel 10, 11, 12. Uh, however, and also mentioned in Joel, the prophecies of Yun, however, and the scattering of Judah are far worse. Again, Luke is Josephian in the content. Um, and then verse 24, a time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. No reference found, but Goyim is simply nations. However, often Israelites or Judahites, the tribes of Israel, um, these tribes are called Goyim numerous times in the Old Testament. Um, so go figure that one out. I guess one other thing to kind of think about this is a little bit weird. Those in Judea or Jerusalem, according to Luke's account. And um, let's see. Let's see about Matthew's too, okay? Um, let him see what Matthew says. 
And let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. I find that strange even in Matthew. And here's why. All right. The topography of Palestine, as I talked a little bit about it earlier, where Jerusalem, Palestine, Jerusalem is, is in the mountains. So Palestine is 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 a long strip of land. <clears throat> at the bottom, it is. I think its greatest width at the bottom is seventy some odd miles, and this is right uh, beneath the Gaza Strip. At the top, it's only about twenty five miles, and just a couple hundred miles long, north to south. Within that topography, what you're going to find in the south, as soon as you get even near uh, the northern tip of the Dead Sea, if we're looking at this in the sense of latitude, it is mountains. Okay, you have a plain that evens out near the sea. You have um, a bit of plain really just where the mountains break going into the sea as far as the Dead Sea. But that area is anything but a plain. It's literally just the break of mountains down into this pit, which is the Dead Sea. Everything else besides that is very rough, rocky, gravelly, hilly land. And again, none of them are mountains. Closest thing you have to mountains are on the other side, which they try to tell us was Moab and Ammon. Uh, mostly around the Dead Sea, but continuing a bit up the Jordan. Um, what you might call tablelands, because it, it's essentially like bluffs uh, on the eastern side. And they're really clear. They, they're right, right there as soon as the Dead Sea ends on the eastern shore. Are these huge bluffs. And they go off for a long ways. None of them, again, would be considered mountains. There are canyons. In these bluffs, um, one extremely large canyon they try to tell us is the River Arnon, which is, again, ridiculous, absurd. Um, really neat canyons. Some of them are. Because, you know, a lot of people, in order for them to increase revenue and tourism, um, they have these trails where they've, they've put um, all of these rope lines up, for instance, um, that canyon is actually called uh, Wadi, um, I think that's uh, Mojib. The one that they try to say is Arnon. That's so towards the middle top of the Dead Sea. And then there's a Wadi towards the south that they try to say is another uh, biblical river. Again, ridiculous, and it's not a river. But they have these treks that you can take uh, th through there. And they're wet, you know, you'd want to wear wet clothes or shorts because you're going to be in water half the time or, or whatever. But they're not big. These, are, they, these aren't large. But that's basically the topography. If you're in Jerusalem, you're in the, the midst of mountains. So it doesn't really make any sense if Jerusalem was in the heart of... Of the and it's not again. I said mountains. These aren't mountains. These are rocky hills. And in Palestine, Jerusalem's just right at the center. It doesn't make really any sense for him to say, "If you would be in Judea, to flee for the mountains, not there, not there." And I think some people, some people have tried to say, "Well, he would. He was referring to Petra." which is a place south of the Dead Sea that they try to say, well, depending on what works best for them, was Edom. Because some maps you'll see, they say that Edom was south of the Dead Sea, and the other ones they try to say that Edom or Idumea, once you get into the Koine Greek, was actually the south part of Palestine, actually covering the southern part of the Dead Sea over to the sea, and none of it works. Not with biblical descriptions. I think it would be a terrible idea 
for anyone to flee from the, the area, if we're in Palestine, to flee from that area of those rocky hills where Palestine Jerusalem is, all the way into the south to this place where they, they, this Petra is, where those uh, most of you will know from those um, essentially elaborate sort of temples that have been carved into the face of the rock over there. Now concerning when those were done, who did them, and why is a, it's a good and interesting question. And I think that leads into a number of speculations which I don't think are without merit. One of those speculations would, would be what were they really doing in that time that they invested so much time, manpower, and money into Palestine that they call the Crusades? I obviously don't think they were doing what they say they were doing, fighting this Muslim Saladin. I'm going to tell you people straight up, and um, anybody can take any insult, uh, as they can take it as insulting as they want to, if they want to take it that way, okay? Even in our own time, let's say the uh, maybe a battle or two that we had early in the Iraqi war, that Saddam Hussein was leading, where people will give you descriptions that um, uh, Western forces were being overcome by him. Well, I, you know, I don't know how genuine that actually is, but consider a few things. One thing is Western forces are so brown and black these days, and they do not make very good soldiers. Sorry. You take an army, though, that is an entirely white or Adamic army, and you take them... <laughs> I, I want to try to make it fair. <laughs> if you give them the same population, as far as manpower, and you give them similar technology as the Arab side, and you put them into a war, it will be over before the day is done. And I mean, I, I think I'm being liberal by saying it would be over before the day is done. I think it would be over even faster than that. I think you can take armies that are far smaller. If we are talking about a Western, if we are talking about a purely Adamic army, which of course the Crusades were supposed to be. You can take an army that's far, 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 far smaller. You can take an army that didn't even have the technology or maybe the training that, um, of course, all of these, um, I don't care what, Arabs, other non-white peoples, they've all actually been trained and equipped and militarized against specific white people, more specifically Germanics and Celts, by our enemies who are also white people. Don't ask me where the J's come into this, because I've explained this before. Um, they are a very convenient, privileged class of people, and we are talking about the Ashkenazim, that have been used as a type of frontman. If you can see them, they're probably not at the top. Arab armies, other armies, oftentimes, every time, and nations, are always backed by our enemies, just as white as us. We're talking about Adamics. And without that backing, and without leadership, a war wouldn't even be a war between us and them. I find it ridiculous beyond the point of just terrific criticism to even consider that as a possibility. That there would be any kind of war. There would have to be so many factors crippling the white side or Adamic side for that to even progress past the day. And when you look at, for instance, the claims of Mohammedan or Muslim invasions into, you know, Spain, Europe, 
North Africa, if it, if it was white at one time, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. If any of those things ever even happen, they happen because they were entirely backed by whites. They were entirely equipped by whites, entirely trained by whites. They were let in just the same as they are today by our enemies, just as white as us. It's all a hoax. It's a hoax that there would even be the need for a war requiring the best and brightest to go to Pal uh, Palestine and fight against the Saladan and his Mohammedans. It is absurd. It's absurd. People who don't think it's absurd hasn't spent enough time around Arabs. No offense. But let's just be let's just be honest without getting all um, soft, emotional, and feeling about it. No need. Crusades, no need. So indeed, what I believe they were doing under some kind of pretext, and far closer to our time than a thousand years ago, is they were overseeing and implementing all manner of projects over there to help the land reflect um, the descriptions that we find in books that have provably no publication date before a couple hundred years ago. Even the ones that were claimed to be published in like the 16th century, so we're no, 1600s, not 16th century, uh, 1600s, like the mid 1600s. So let's say like Josephus and um, I, th I want to say Eusebius or Jerome are claimed to have been published in the six mid 1600s. I don't know of any hard, solid proof that they were. There's a lot more substantial proof that these first appeared in publication form in the 1800s. Josephus, Eusebius, Jerome, any of these uh, establishment favored historians. And they all seem to echo the, the sorts of things that we can see in Palestine, which are not biblical things. What they do is they pick a very few amount of of places to focus on all of these writers which is kind of interesting that they would do that you would think if if this was indeed the land of the bible that they would focus on different things these guys but it's it's all an echo chamber it's all mockingbird um and that's what they do and that's how this this deception is pulled off and if Josephus is a, the, a cornerstone, which I think the writings are, to this deception, because as Steve Mason pointed out in, I think, the introduction to this book, is that there has not been a, an Israeli archaeologist that hasn't gone around the land of Palestine with a copy of Josephus in hand to give him an idea of where and how to look into what things. It's all intertwined, the, uh, the assumptions of archaeology and the assumptions of history and geography, all intertwined, all intertwined. So if Luke can be shown to be following or harmonious with Josephus more than other Gospels or the Law and the Prophets, then this is certainly a factor that has to um, have a lot of weight in what we think of Luke at the end of the day. So with that, this was probably kind of a long one. I'll wrap it up and we will pick up uh, next time, starting at Luke 21, 25, really only have a, a, a small way to go. And then we're through the Olivet Discourse. And then of course we have to talk about the specifics of the trial, crucifixion, so on and so forth. So. It's going to take a few episodes. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think about those ideas I said concerning the briefs. If you want to hear from me a couple of times a week, that's completely fine. 
Uh, I don't mind at all. I don't always have, uh, you know, real specific complete topics, but I can certainly um, bring a perspective and an amount of material that I really don't think anybody out there right now can. So let me know, and uh, I'll see you next time.